The wicked, wacky wit of a beauty named Elvira has been bewitching viewers for the past few years. I haven't had any complaints yet. Now she's making her big screen bow. Entitled Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, the movie casts a whole new light on Nightmare Alley's Dream Girl. Yeah, the big screen gives me a lot more room for expression, and it's also more comfortable because I was kind of like squished in that small television box, you know. But you do get to see more of me because I wear some rather brief costumes, <laughs> as opposed to this turtleneck look. On TV, a lot of letter writers always say, Elvira, why do you only have one leg? But uh, I finally wear like some short costumes so you get to see both of them. You looking for me? The movie, says Elvira, is autobiographical. Well, it's a true story about my life. I was raised in an orphanage. Yeah, my mother had to drop me off there. It was like, I was the only, only kid in school that had to have like a size 38D pinafore. Ugh, puberty, don't talk to me about puberty. When I was in high school then, I was like the only girl in the whole yearbook that had a picture in the yearbook that folded out. And tell them, tell them that when all is said and done, I only ask that people remember me by two simple words. Any two as long as they're simple. This morning, on my regular tour of the boys' lavatory, I confiscated this. I mean, I developed faster than a Polaroid. I, I was so young, and I was I, I tried it for the cheerleader, and I kept knocking myself out. Let's do it! This Elvira is a person of easy virtue, purveyor of pulchritude, a one-woman Sodom and Gomorrah, if you will, a slimy, slithering succubus. A concubine, a streetwalker, a tramp, a slut, a cheap whore! In this movie, I find out where my parents came from. The town is sort of like Salem. And it's called Falwell, Massachusetts. Listen, young lady, I don't know who you are or where you came from, but you most certainly don't fit in this town. Why, you don't even fit in that dress. The people there are really like uptight, kind of preservatives, you know? So I come into town, and they're not so thrilled that I'm there. <laughs> I have to collect my aunt's inheritance. So, finally I collect it, but it's not exactly what I've been dreaming about. I mean, it's just like a run-down house and a dog and this crummy book. The dog is a real scene stealer. I mean, the dog gets paid for like just doing stuff like sitting and like, like putting his hands over his eyes and going like this. You know, and I mean, I have to work so much harder and get the same money. I discover I have this uncle, and uh, yeah, he's a pretty weird character. He who holds the book of sight when the moon is drained of all its light will then be ruler of the night, master of the dark. I scared her at the readings, actually. That's why, she, that's why I got the job. I sort of did a leer on her, and she sort of went, oh, God, you're creepy. Elvira has one other enemy to cope you're with. You're quite welcome. You know, as I always say, morals aren't cheap. And speaking of cheap, uh, a little birdie told me that that Elvira woman is related to you. There's now, one person in the town right. named Chastity Pariah who is the self-proclaimed upholder of the morals. I can't remember when I've been this hungry. This was the Morality Club mm. Day picnic. Party. And uh, we're going to have come here and have a very nice time, you know, and listen to Bringing in the Sheaves by the American Legion Band. And, um, of course, Elvira does um, a pretty turn with her uh, crock pot of casserole. The crock pot uh, turns out to be an aphrodisiac, so the town council gets into a pretty pickle. Oh, boy. Am I a horn dog? <gasps> the Elvira world. Is, is a rather specialized one that has, it, she finds uh, weird stuff attractive and she finds strange stuff funny. Roger Ebert called me a cross between Mae West and Vampirella. I think of myself more as a cross between, oh, and Margaret and E.T. As odd as the character is and as much of a character as it is, she's still very human and vulnerable. And that's what really, I think, attracts all sorts of people, really. She has fans from six years old to 90 years old. A lot of the plot depends on magic and fire and, and uh, demonry and things like that. But 
It's not as easy as it appears to do that sort of thing. With all the explosions, creeps, <laughs> crawlies, and monsters, is there anything that scares Elvira? Yeah, doing this interview might do it. Any last words? Uh, just one. When the sultry siren known as Elvira makes her big screen debut, she'll introduce a bizarre new star car. Up in, sailor. The movie is Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. <laughs> the car is called the Macabre Mobile. Jerry, you forgot your axe. Well, I have my Macabre Mobile, which I hop in and I go across country. And of course, it's a beautiful uh, refurbished 1958 T-Bird, my favorite car, and we put a little, you know, a few spikes on the dashboard, which is really like gnarly if you're in a collision and you hit your head on the dashboard. <laughs> and um, a few skulls and crossbones on the wheels and on the steering wheel and some barbed wire around the rear view mirror. Yeah, we took sort of an ordinary car and then I used a chainsaw and cut off the roof first. And then we put the spikes and the uh, leopard seat covers on it. I have this thing for skulls. I just, uh, I don't know what it is. But... It is, in general, uh, the car that, uh, that one would expect Elvira to drive and was crafted and realized to such perfection by our crack transportation department. We sent them on a grand 1958 black T-bird hunt. It's really hard to turn the steering wheel. It's a really old car, so I'm kind of swerving all over the place when I drive. <laughs> Would one of you big, strong men mind giving me a little push? <laughs> it has been hauled through the streets and created quite a sensation, as you can imagine. Yeah, people kind of notice it. motion picture debut as the Mistress of the Dark, the bewitching Elvira has a hot time in an old town at night. Her mortal enemy is Chastity Pariah, played by Edie McClurg. Well, I never. I'm the moral leader of Falwell, Massachusetts. I am the president, pro tem, and for all eternity of the Morality Club. Chastity, the picnic's a great success. Yes. I think it's something we can all be proud of me for. We put on a picnic that gets a little out of hand. The crock pot turns out to be an aphrodisiac. When they open that pot, they're gonna need all the luck they can get. Oh, I don't believe I've had any of this. I particularly enjoy it, especially, because it's always good to see, you know, the pompous and the person who sets themselves superior brought low. Oh, boy. Am I a horn dog? Edie's been cooking up a lot of laughter in films like Ferris Bueller's Day Off and the hit TV series, The Hogan Family. I'm a lot different from all of my characters because many of them are quite extroverted and, you know, bossy. Not that it's any of my business, but then, of course, everything is. Edie McClurg was a Kansas City disc jockey until she came to San Francisco to visit her brother. I went on vacation. Don't ever go on vacation if you don't want to change your whole lifestyle. Her brother introduced her to improv comedy. Within a few years, she'd moved to Los Angeles. Elvira and uh, John Paragon, who wrote the film Elvira, and myself were all in a group called The Groundlings. And I started doing Dear Abby at The Groundlings, answering questions off the cuff from the audiences. So I would just say that, you know, I've moved out here from Los Angeles to Los Angeles from Chicago. You know, the wind there, they call it the hawk because it just blows in off like Michigan and forces the mucus right back up into your nose. Now Edie and Elvira are together again. Listen, young lady, I don't know who you are or where you came from, but you most certainly don't fit in this town. Why, you don't even fit in that dress. Listen, sister, if I want your opinion, I'll beat it out of you. Of course I'm shot. I'm in charge of everything, don't you know? <laughs> oh, and uh, don't forget, next week, it's the head with two things. Uh, I mean, the thing with two heads. And until then, this is Elvira saying, unpleasant dreams. The sultry beauty known as Elvira 
who has given some of Hollywood's wildest horror movies a new lease on life, after death, is making her own movie bow. The title of the film is Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. <laughs> it's a clever title, don't you think? I'm a movie horror hostess in LA, and I quit my job. I don't have to take this from anybody. And as for you, you and, uh, this cow and go across the country. So it's kind of like the adventures of how I kind of discover my past, and I ran into some relatives I didn't know I had. A lot of the plot depends on magic and fire and and uh, demonry. The climax of the movie is a confrontation, a kind of a high noon showdown with her uncle, who is a warlock of some 300 years standing. The master shot was the scariest for Elvira, which was the last shot that we did, because the master shot, that's everything burns. And actually, you know, she was you know, two feet away from flame on all four sides. She was really in a precarious situation. And I said, you are getting the hell out of here as soon as the first explosion goes, because otherwise I'm going to run right through you. And she went, oh, you wouldn't. I said, yes, I sort of would. The notion of combining Elvira's wacky world with high-tech razzle-dazzle was advanced by film executive Brandon Tartikoff. I think um, the secret of Elvira's appeal, beyond the obvious, is that she's somebody who says what she's thinking almost at all times. It doesn't matter if you're a kid, a teenager, or a repressed adult. You wish you could say what's on your mind, and she does. Love you, Mary. No hard liquor served past 8 o'clock. Do you want a virgin? Maybe, but uh, I'll have a couple of drinks first. We get to live her world for about 100 minutes, and that's kind of fun, and it, it certainly presents Elvira in a way that they haven't seen her.